Amazing. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Um, so I am Lilia from Territory 3, Kiwi Landing Pad Reimagines. We help uh, Kiwi startup founders who are expanding and going global. And someone um, who I met over in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago when we were over there is Jeff Wallace. Um, now, Jeff is brilliant. He um, is an entrepreneur himself. He's founded a few startups. And um, the main one that we'll be chatting about is Silicon Valley in your pocket, um, which is all about helping founders from around the world. Even if you can't physically get to Silicon Valley, you can still have access to all those kind of mentors, um, resources and insights. Um, and just, yeah, to grow your startup from there. So I'd love um, to introduce Jeff, Jeff and I'd love to ask if you could do just a little bit of a background on, um, you know, how did you get into this? Um, how did it all start? Sure. Thanks, Lilia. It's uh, it's really fun to be here chatting with you. You know, it was nicer in person, but I'll take the Zoom as this is the best we can get right now. Um, so yeah, how did I get started? So just I'll go back all the way, but I'll go very quickly. I'm originally from the East Coast of the U.S., and uh, I grew up in the New York, New Jersey area, and I started my career on Wall Street. And then after a few years of doing that, I thought I would go out to the West Coast to, to do two years of graduate school. And that has now turned into 32 years now. So I've been out here quite a long time. And uh, I really kind of fell in love with the San Francisco, Silicon Valley, the Bay Area. Um, I did kind of study entrepreneurship and technology, which are certainly very popular here. It's a good area to be in if you're studying uh, those things. And so I kind of transitioned my career into entrepreneurial type things. And I started out of my grad school in management consulting with large companies. But a few years afterwards, I, I jumped into the entrepreneurial um, waters, if you will. And I kind of was in that area from the mid 1990s all the way up until about 2011. Um, so about 16 or 17 years, I was an entrepreneur with some good businesses and some bad businesses. Even the bad businesses had amazing aspects and parts of the journey were incredible. I, um, I got to work with, uh, with some of my partners in one of our businesses. We got to work with Apple Computer and we got that uh, partnership by meeting individually with Steve Jobs and another senior executive at Apple at the time, Phil Schiller. Um, that was an amazing experience. I mean, to get to meet such an incredible person in, in technology and an icon, obviously, of technology and innovation. And then um, got into a corporate job for a couple of years uh, in mobile technology when that emerged. And uh, did that for a couple of years for a very large um, consulting and systems integration company. And I was there for just about two years when I like to think they reminded me that I really prefer working with more nimble startups. I mean, the company is great. I have nothing bad about the company, but I was just more inclined towards working with startups and that the energy and the innovation and the creativity. And so in 2015, I uh, was a co-founder of a, an incubator accelerator here in Silicon Valley called The Battery with a number of partners. And I was loving that uh, for the first few years we were doing it. Uh, myself and a, a colleague were kind of co-leaders of the organization. And it was, it was brilliant. It was fun. But in 2018, I realized there's a lot of foreign founders that were coming to Silicon Valley trying to kind of live the, the entrepreneurial dream. And so um, with uh, a couple of colleagues, we launched a virtual accelerator, Silicon Valley in Your Pocket. So What's been amazing is since 2015, I've had the chance to work with probably close to 1,500 companies around the world. It's now exceeded 40 countries that we've worked with founders and other accelerators and incubators in. I would say every day I'm working with you know one, two, or three countries. This morning, um, uh, my one of my business partners in Silicon Valley in your pocket and I presented to a group in uh, the Republic of Georgia in Eastern Europe. We work with groups all over Europe and Asia and South and Central America and the U.S. as well. I don't want to exclude those in the U.S. We certainly work with a lot of U.S. companies and, and also down in your area, New Zealand, Australia. Um, we work with companies everywhere. So it's been a brilliant journey for me. I've had a, a tremendous amount of fun about it. Yeah, amazing. Honestly, it sounds like you've done so much cool stuff. Um, and what you've built is incredible. And working with so many different entrepreneurs around the world is so amazing. Um, and really cool to hear there are some people from um, down here in um, New Zealand. And there are indeed. Yeah, there are indeed. Amazing. And you, you, have you been here yourself? 
I've been down to the area numerous times. I've been to Australia several times. I've been in New Zealand, um, predominantly on the South Island. I spent about several weeks there really as a tourist, to be honest, there was not much business going on, but um, I just have nothing but incredibly fond um, memories of that trip and am mm -hmm. very excited to be getting back down there, which I plan to do actually sometime this year. I, I do have plans in the next six months to be back down there, in New Zealand okay. specifically. Perfect. Yeah, borders are open. Um, keen for anyone to, to come over. Um, tourism, business, whatever it is. Um, Help me in. Have you? Amazing. <laughs> um, so, in terms of um, some common mistakes you've seen founders make, um, what do you think would be the biggest ones? Well, you know, there there's a lot of things that. Um, an entrepreneur has to deal with. So it's kind of easy. Myself, I made plenty of mistakes as a founder. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of easy to do that. When I think about the mistakes that founders make, it's amazing now that I've been doing this full time for so long, I've learned quite a bit actually in just the last several years, seven years specifically doing this. I haven't just been kind of a mentor and coach. I've been a learner. I've been learning a lot as well. And what we have found, when you look at the market, about over 40% of companies actually fail because there's no product market fit. And it's amazing to think because that's kind of in the control of a founder. And I'm not suggesting I was any smarter. I, when I was a startup founder, we made, as I'm gonna share mistakes here, I think I probably made all, if not most of them, or most, if not all of them. So I think understanding a true product market fit is a big issue. A lot of people come up with an idea and they think, well, it's a great idea. And they don't take the opportunity to actually do the validation. And they presume that their instincts are right and that what their belief is, is true and they don't test it as much. So I think one thing is, you know, do the proper amount of validation. It's critically important to move your product into the market after you've done that validation and not expend so many resources, you know, prior to doing that. A lot of people will build MVPs. We hear this all the time from founders. They're so, so excited to tell us, hey, we built our MVP. And our usual answer is whatever, like that's, that's not interesting to us. And they kind of say, what do you mean it's not interesting? We're so excited we built our MVP. And our standard answer is, well, all that shows is you know how to build something. What it doesn't show is that anyone cares and that what you've built is actually solving a problem for somebody. So that's where we kind of shift the semantics, if you will. And we kind of say, you should really focus on minimum viable traction, MVT. And that means you're delivering the promise of your, of your widget. It's delivering the benefits that you say it's going to deliver. It's solving the problem for somebody in a meaningful way. So that's something we certainly see. A lot of resources are often expended building those MVPs, and, and we think they should take a little more time before doing that. Hmm. I'll say- uh, um, A term we haven't come across too much in New Zealand, um, at least from what I've seen in MVT. Um, yeah, it, it's not a very common term. I'll be honest, we don't hear it frequently. There's um, one gentleman that um, my partner Cal and I had met with, who had written a book on traction. And it was really, he is probably the only other person I've ever heard other than Cal and myself in our business using that lingo. So I think um, it, it's, it is a critically in, uh, important nuance, though, building an MVP without understanding that it's actually solving that need and the, and the challenges that people have and delivering benefits, that's where we it's draw the distinction. Some people would say we've done that when we built our MVP, but we still wanna hone in on the language and the importance of doing that validation prior to just expending resources building things. Other things we see is that, that people build um, teams with people oftentimes that are like them. So programmers hang out with programmers. So now you have a team of all programmers. Well, that doesn't necessarily make the journey of a startup much easier. You want to have a balanced and diverse team, not just of, of operating uh, personnel on the, on the team itself, but even inclusive of your advisors. You want to have good diversity. You want to have good experiences. You want people that maybe have done a startup and, and kind of been down that path before who can help guide. Um, if you're a tech person, get a business person. If you're a business person, have a tech person. You're kind of going to run into both. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something we see happen a lot. I think in addition, I would say people need to understand it's okay to be humble and not know something. Um, I think it's okay to ask for help. Uh, sometimes people think asking questions uh, or asking for help is a sign of weakness. We actually view it as a sign of strength. 
you're, you're comfortable with what you do know and you're comfortable with what you do not know and you're comfortable enough to go seek the help. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's, you know, we try to offer what we wished, what I wished existed when I was a, an entrepreneur, you know, and give founders today those kinds of access to resources that are non-judgmental. And there's a lot of mentors that are non-judgmental. I'm not trying to say we have anything special about us. There's lots of us uh, that do mentoring that are very much this way. But I, I think being humble enough to know what you do and what you don't know and where you need help and being comfortable to ask for it, I think is an important thing for founders. Yeah, 100%. That's, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, now, I know you do a little bit of um, angel investing, um, as well as, of course, through Silicon Valley in your pocket, um, helping to connect founders with investors. Um, what kind of um, things would you say that investors are looking for um, at the moment when they receive a pitch deck? You know, it's interesting when, when you think about an investor, you know, it could be an angel investor, it could be an angel group, or it could be maybe an early stage venture firm, you know, at, at in general, they're getting more than one pitch that might show up in their inbox, right? They're getting maybe tens, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds. Some firms are probably getting even thousands of submissions a month from founders, very creative and innovative and eager founders who need funding. And, and you end up with what I would call the big stack and the short stack. The big stack is someone's reviewing all these inbound, and they're really looking at a few things. They're not going to take 15 or even five minutes to look at the, each deck. Because if you get a thousand decks, you can't take five minutes just reviewing each deck. So they're really looking very quickly. And I think the top things that they need to look for that are critical, and you can answer yes or no to these questions. And the, that determines whether your presentation ends up in the big stack that never gets reviewed or the short stack that gets considered for investment. The things are, is there a real problem that was presented in a relatable fashion? Can I, can I relate? to this problem when I'm reading it. Now that could either be the investor themselves or maybe a team in, an, in a venture firm might have a team that are reviewing all of these. So they're asking people, look at the problem. Does it make sense? Can you relate to it? Do you believe that that is a problem people would be willing to pay something and you know, drive some opportunity for the business uh, to solve that problem? If the answer is no, goes to the big stack, never, never, be, never to be seen again. If the answer is yes, then you go to take a look at the solution. Does the solution feel plausible that it can solve that problem? If the answer is no, big stack. If the answer is still yes, then you say, great, let's keep looking. Does this team have the capability to execute? All those other slides that we are asking people, and we ask as well for founders to put in the deck, are kind of interesting. But if you don't have a real problem and you don't have a real solution, I don't really care if you have a fantastic financial forecast. It's not going to make a difference. I don't care how great your go-to-market strategy is. You don't have a real problem you're solving with a real solution. So problem, solution, and can this team execute? Those are the most important things. And then if you're really interested, you'd probably look at the traction area and say, have they demonstrated traction? Have they shown they have execution capability? And that would make it even more interesting in the further consideration of those short stacked uh, kind of pitch decks. Cool, amazing. Yeah, those are some really good criteria um, for anyone listening or, or listening to the recording of this to, to have a think about. And I know um, we've had some really great um, webinars with Nick Crocker from Blackbird, where he evaluates pitch decks um, live, um, real time. And you can just see, yeah, just the speed at which he goes through them. Um, you do have to, you know, you have to have those those top points um, straight at the front there. Otherwise, yep, you, you'll get thrown into the other pile. Um, that's really it, it could, it, You can end up in the wrong pile very quickly yeah. if it's not. You, you really have about um, literally uh, less than 30 seconds to intrigue someone enough with the title slide and the problem slide. If they can't get past that, you're going to end up in, a, in the wrong stack. Yeah. Um, so with the um, businesses that come through Silicon Valley in your pocket, are these ones that you work directly with or what kind of level of involvement do you have um, with them? And what have you been, yeah, what kind of um, businesses are you seeing coming through there? So, you know, we are not an industry um, focused accelerator. So we're, we are wide, wide spectrum in terms of industry focus. Uh, we have companies across so many industries. It's, it's astounding. Um, the things we get to see and, and the creativity we get to learn about as founders find us. We are stage focused. So we tend to be pre-seed, like very early stage or, or seed stage. If you've already raised, say, a series A, you're probably beyond the uh, primary benefits that we could offer. We'd like to think we could offer value as well, but you're probably beyond that. So our involvement is really um, kind of twofold. On the early part, 
if you come in and you join a cohort, it's all virtual. So you can take it wherever you are. And that was by design. It was built that way. And it's really been designed also to be self-paced. So we kind of remove the geography and remove the timing for the most part, meaning it's all video on demand, if you will, the, the content or the curriculum. Where we do have some timing constraints is we do have live group office hours. And those, because of the breadth of, uh, around the globe of countries that we cover and therefore time zones we cover, we host them at all sorts of crazy hours. Sometimes they're you know, early in the morning in the Pacific time, sometimes they're late at night in the Pacific time and really anything in between. So that allows us, we host several throughout the week so that people um, wherever they are, can opt into whatever session uh, makes sense for them. But at least they can take the vast majority of the program at their own leisure. And then our involvement is in the live coaching hours. And then sometimes we do get some uh, companies that are a little bit further along and want to migrate from the group kind of coaching to get a little more dedicated, more one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so we do have some one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, clients as well, those we get much more involved with. We do a variation. Uh, we have various programs, but that could be as much as a three-month program where we're working with them over a period of three months. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. And in terms of investing, do you end up personally investing in any of these startups that have come through? Uh, most definitely, we invest in, in some of the companies, and I emphasize the word some. Um, it's interesting. There are some accelerators and, and some funds, and I'm even an LP, a, a limited partner in a couple of funds myself that invest this way. They'll open up an application window. Everybody applies. They'll review and, and you know, kind of filter down those that they find compelling and want to invite in, and those often are then selected for an investment. So they kind of invest post a, an application window, if you will. And then they hope that they're going to work out well in the course of kind of acceleration and coaching uh, or from that point forward. I think of that as invest and pray. It's not a good strategy in my view for the long term. So what we do in Silicon Valley in your pocket is we accelerate and work with founders, give them a chance to get to know us, give us a chance to get to know them. And if we feel compelled you know, after a period of time working with them, then we make independent in investment decisions. We do not commit an investment um, uh, for any percentage of equity or anything like that. They're, they're really independent of Silicon Valley in your pocket, if you will. But that's how we meet a lot of our deal flow as they come through the acceleration programs with us. Mm, awesome. Okay. You know, that, that's a cool model. Um, so so that initially it is open for just anyone to jump into the program um, and then later down the track, you, you see if there is, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and in terms of um, raising investment, curious about your thoughts on, I guess, Kiwi startups in particular, since a lot of um, our audience watching are, are Kiwis. Um, and what, yeah, what would, have you kind of observed in terms of Kiwi startups um, getting involved either in Silicon Valley in your pocket or over um, in San Francisco in the States itself? And um, what's the environment like yeah, for Kiwis and, and for raising investment from the States? Yeah, and this gets asked of us uh, quite often because so many of our clients are non-US, right? They're, they're yeah. typically with Silicon Valley in your pocket, I would say 65 to 70% of our clientele are international. And so that's a very common question is, hey, will we be able to attract US investors to our business? So same for, for Kiwi and uh, founders as well. The, the question, I normally answer that question with one question mm -hmm. back to the founder, which is how familiar are you founder with the US investment laws. And they typically will say, well, well, not very, I'm not from the US. And I say, and that's how familiar US investors are with your country's investment laws, whether it's New Zealand or, or wherever it may be. And so typically the recommendation we will give is if you're truly interested in attracting the attention and financial support of US investors, it would be ideal to establish a US entity, uh, most likely a Delaware C Corp. That here in the US is the most common and most familiar structure. There are others, but that is the primary structure and also form a US banking relationship. And we help companies with that. We have relationships that uh, allow them to get an entity and a bank account and other things established for just 500 USD. So it's actually not an expensive endeavor, um, but it is a commitment on behalf of the founding team to establish that US presence. And that goes far beyond just those things. Those are kind of the legal and banking establishing your presence, but there's of course, marketing presence, websites, 
things of that sort. So we do recommend that most of the foreign founders establish a U.S. presence. Now, oftentimes they might have, a, say, a Kiwi company already, which holds intellectual property. Maybe they have some IP or something. What we would recommend in that case is no different than investors anywhere else. U.S. investors want to invest in the company that owns the IP. So you can't keep the IP in your Kiwi company and establish, say, a sales company in the U.S. and attract investment into the sales company because that's not the one that is the owner of the intellectual property. So typically it's called an inversion where you would take, for example, your Kiwi company and make it a subsidiary of your U.S. entity. That way, if the U.S. entity is on top and the Kiwi company is owned by the U.S. entity and you invest in the U.S. entity, you kind of get ownership in everything beneath that. So that's a, a fairly common practice for foreign companies. It's not a recommendation 100% of the time because there are countries like Canada, for example, whose government does a lot of funding for Canadian startups. But if they do that inversion that I just described, the funding stops or gets reduced. So we don't necessarily recommend that approach with Canadian companies because of the very uh, generous funding that their government provides to them. Yeah, awesome. There's honestly some really great insights um, for any um, founders watching on setting up in the US. And I know um, we are looking as well at doing a webinar um, with Rebecca Freeman around um, um, visas and, and tax obligations and all that kind of um, more in-depth kind of um, um, insight well, that you need to, to get set up over there. So it's definitely yeah, front of mind for a lot of um, founders I know are looking to, to head over there um, in the near future. I know she's, I know she's on here because I tried to yeah. say hello and misspelled her name, but I yeah. will say I'm not saying this because she's here. Nobody yeah. better than her to help with with those kinds of issues, getting yeah. under a clear understanding of how you can set up a, a business and get all the immigration matters solved. So um, it's awesome that she's there and able to help New Zealand founders. Yeah, brilliant, amazing. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to that web webinar um, with Rebecca. Um, yep. Amazing, cool. So in terms of, um, yeah, there's Kiwi startups heading over to the States. Um, are there any other yeah, um, recommendations, tips um, that you'd have for, um, for Kiwis going over? I know, um, so we just came back, um, T3, me and John, um, from a trip over to San Francisco and Austin. Um, one of the things we did discover is the prices are insane at the moment. Um, everything is so expensive. Um, and perhaps, you know, the typical um, trip, you know, the trip of going over um, for a founder is, is a lot more of a big deal now when you have to put so much, um, you know, capital behind it. Um, what kind of other, yeah, things have you observed or any, yeah, tips and tricks um, for Kiwis looking to head over? Yeah, I mean, listen, you guys are, are obviously the creators of the Kiwi landing pad, co-working space. It's, mm -hmm. it's any of those kinds of co-working environments where yeah. shared resources can reduce prices. You're not having to spend for an office on your own. You're just kind of taking up a seat or a desk, et cetera. I definitely recommend that. The Bay Area is unfortunately very expensive, not just on New Zealand standards, on US standards, the Bay yeah. Area is very expensive. So it's kind of very expensive on any, any measure of standard you look at at that. Uh, from. But I would also say leverage locals, either those from the diaspora, other Kiwis that are here, leverage advisors. I mean, if you're really trying to establish a business here in the U.S., get some U.S. advisors. Uh, we help so many teams establish their advisory boards and get very, um, what I would say, compelling and a little bit of, these are advisors who we, we strive to get advisors. We're not always successful, but we strive to get advisors that kind of stop an investor in their track and give them the, hey, wait a minute, if this person's an advisor here, this company must be doing something pretty interesting. So someone that's got a lot of market credibility themselves, we try to identify those advisors as well. Mm, amazing. Um, and yeah, and just on that note, um, something else we discovered on our trip is, um, um, this thing called the AWS Startup Loft. Now, AWS is a sponsor of Kiwi Landing Pad at Territory 3 now. Um, sure. And so they offer free co-working space. So unlimited free co-working space for people who are in their Activate program. Otherwise, um, up to 30 days free for anyone. Um, and that's really cool, right, right in the heart of um, San Francisco. Um, and we also have a great relationship with Trellis Workspace, um, yep. where we can provide some member deals, um, some day passes if, if someone is, you know, if you're looking to head over there for a couple of days on a trip, um, as well as, yeah, yeah, the, um, the discounted membership. Um, and they also offer a really cool service where um, you can sort of have a, a US address and that'll go to them and they can um, scan your mail, send it to you. So that can also help, um, you know, with the legalities of, of um, having business in the US. 
Um, I just Absolutely. noticed there's a bit of chat chat going on in our um in our chat box. Um, if Great. you guys wanted to have a look, and there's some cool insights coming through. Um, amazing. Um, so back to um, our points to chat about. Um, how can a startup demonstrate credibility to investors? So that's a good one because mm. again, when there's such a an enormous deal flow coming into investors, it's those that really do have something that stands above and credibility and confidence. You know, any interaction you have with a either an investor or a prospective partner or whoever, your goal as a founder should be to instill confidence, right? Show credibility and, and things of that sort. So really you want to demonstrate again, yet you have a, a grasp on your, your market. You, you want to be able to relate your story very, very well to them. You want to highlight your team's credibility. Maybe you have people who have had prior exits um, or some really great unique skills, like you might have someone who's really quite an expert in machine learning or AI or VR or Web3, you know, now that's obviously a very hot topic as well. So if you have those skills in your team, highlight that, that will certainly establish a certain degree of credibility. And I think demonstrating that you understand the investor's concerns is a really important thing that, you know, when you and I are talking with one another, we want to hope that we each have empathy for one another, right? So as, as two people engaging. So as a founder, you want to hope that the investor is going to have empathy for you. Well, one way you have to realize is they also want you to have empathy for them. They're an investor. They're, you're asking them to part with hard-earned money in support of your business. And so you have to speak to investors um, in a way that demonstrates that. And what I mean by that is I can't count how many times I'm pitched as a prospective investor and they tell me all about the company and they tell me nothing about how an investor is going to make any money. And they're talking to me as a prospective investor. So they're not really showcasing to me that they understand my concerns. How am I going to ever get my investment out? So they might not talk about an exit. They might not talk about return on investment. Um, probably not the best way to engage and instill confidence in an investor that you're doing things that are acknowledging their considerations and their concerns. So I also think something to establish confidence in investors is have your information, what would be called due diligence, right? An investor is going to want to do due diligence on uh, your company if they're going to consider an investing. Have all of that available. Don't wait for the questions to then figure out, oh yeah, we have to go create a document that shows this. Have it all ready. And one of the things we focus on in our uh, Silicon Valley in Your Pocket program is every founder kind of completes the program with a, do, a due diligence or online deal room where we call it link ready. Somebody expresses interest and says, you know what? Lilia, that's a great idea. I'm really interested. Can you share more information with the business and the opportunity with me? And you say, that's great. Just type your email here and then I'll copy the link in and here's my whole deal room. All the due diligence is there that you could want to see. It's properly laid out in folders. Here's the corporate information. Here's the legal agreements. Here's the marketing plan. Like it's all just laid out in a very um, easy and intuitive way. If that doesn't send confidence to an investor that, wow, these people are on top of your, your game. And you're in, in this case, I'd be looking at that going, wow, Lilia is absolutely on top of it. She knows exactly what I want to see when I'm going to consider making an investment. So we think of it as link ready. That's the term we use. And that without saying anything, just sending that message back to someone very quickly in response to the request for more information gives a ton of confidence to investors. Amazing. Yeah. So really just be prepared as, as much as possible um, for anything that they could yeah, ask for or want to know. Um, and I've just noticed a couple of questions um, actually come through in the q and I, sure. I think we're about up to um, Q&A time anyway. Um, so just on here from Ellen. Um, have you ever met a founder who had great IP, IP but was pursuing the wrong market and then you convinced them to pivot? If so, can you give any examples of success stories? Um, yeah, for wrong. sure. I, I mean, I think with certainty that the idea of pivoting is a big thing. You know, the one thing you'll hear from people in kind of Silicon Valley and elsewhere is it's okay to fail, but do it fast and as inexpensively as possible. Make the pivot as quickly as you can. Some people, um, I think I've been guilty of this myself in my early years as an entrepreneur, you really believe and you have conviction in your idea. And so you stick with it a lot longer than you may need to. 
But certainly there are companies that we talk to about either their business model may need some modification uh, because it's kind of standing in the way of something. So they might have to pivot, not necessarily the entire IP, um, but we, they certainly have to pivot aspects of their business. Maybe the markets, uh, the go-to-market channels that they're pursuing. And I think to the point of the specific question, there is sometimes where you think you have IP that's good for one thing, and it may be good for that thing, but maybe, um, you know, I am working with a company right now. This may serve as an example. Let me back up a moment. It's a hardware company. They've made a hardware device that sanitizes and deodorizes uh, apparel. So think about the world of COVID that we've been living in. They were going down this path originally, um, just trying to do sanitization pre-COVID. Then COVID hit and they thought, well, maybe this works in the COVID world. And so maybe we should test it. So they put it into test with some very prominent laboratories here in the US and lo and behold, their device actually eradicates the COVID virus. So if you have something like a shirt and you put it in there, no chance any viruses or bacteria can survive. And mm -hmm. so they thought, well, that's the way we should go. And then we started to see the company pivot in that direction. And then you run into, well, that requires FDA and regulatory. Well, that's going to be a much longer journey, much harder journey, possibly more expensive journey. And so we started going down that path, but realized that path isn't going to lead to financial opportunities, revenue generation for quite some time. And it's going to require a significant investment. So we kind of pivoted back a little bit towards the non-regulated areas. So we're not doing FDA required use cases. And so they've pivoted back so that they can remain viable and sustainable as a business. And so they're still using the same IP, but in a different way that's not running into these regulatory challenges that will take long and be very costly to overcome. Not in a bad way, but they ultimately hope to get there, but they need to sustain themselves through difficult economic times like we're finding right now in order to get to that point. So they have had to take their IP, which has a, was in a medically oriented market and pivoted to non-medical, non-regulated, non-FDA required markets as an example. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, just on that note, um, have you, you know, have you seen any changes just in, in the most recent couple of months? Obviously, there's all this talk of a recession and people are a little nervous. Um, what have you kind of observed and, and what advice would you give to founders who, you know, might be feeling a little bit nervous at the moment? Yeah, um, the short answer is yes. We certainly see investors um, maybe putting a foot on the brakes a little bit, slowing yeah. down the investment. Um, there's Across the internet, you can find various uh, venture capital firms telling their portfolio, hey, be prepared to survive on what you've got for the next 12, 18, 24 months. There won't be in, you know, incremental capital. Mm -hmm. My instincts are, knowing some folks in the space, that if you're really a great company doing well, um, there's still capital available, but it will be harder to come across. I don't think it's, they didn't shut off the, the faucet, but they definitely are being much more selective where those dollars will go and being much more cautious, which I think is wise. The economic, you know, the macroeconomic conditions are, are certainly challenging. Um, so I think, I think yes is the short answer. There is definitely a slowdown. My recommendation to founders is kind of pump the brakes on your burn rate, lower your spend, get don't, this is not the time to overspend. This is the time to conserve capital. Um, attempt as quickly as possible to get to revenue generation. Sometimes people will hold that off for, for good and sometimes for not good, but sometimes it is for valid reasons. They're holding off revenue generation. I would encourage founders to try to get to revenue generation as quickly as possible. That will demonstrate some confidence and provide some much needed capital to sustain through these difficult times. It's, you know, it's anyone's guess as to how long this, these uh, market circumstances will last. But I, I think pump the brakes on the spend, really get back to conserving, don't over hire, maybe outsource something if you can, you know, try to use outsourced resources that don't have say overhead, you know, that you might have to pay fringe and fringe benefits and other uh, costs associated to employees versus being able to outsource. Even if your intention is to hire someone, maybe hold off on the hire and bring them in at a later time. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, some really great insight there. And um, um, just going back to a question from before, actually, um, from Rebe Rebecca, um, asking if you can speak to the cultural differences, um, like US views versus NZ views, especially around um, self-promotion. I mean, I've definitely, you know, I know Americans are very confident, very out there, 
Um, compared yeah. to Kiwis, we're, we're quite shy. We're very humble, um, even nervous to, you know, to speak of ourselves. Um, so yeah, what, what have you seen in terms of those differences? Yeah, and, and listen, it's a great question. Thank you, Rebecca, for that, because it is not just a, a, a New Zealand, you know, Kiwi question, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a global question. I deal with, like this morning, I mentioned I, I was working with a group in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europeans, if I could generalize, there are certainly exceptions to these things, but generally speaking, um, we're very open here. We're very collaborative here. Um, you know, it, it's very unusual, for example, to get an investor to sign an NDA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the, in the Silicon Valley, people don't even ask anymore for the most part. I mean, sometimes you'll get people asking. And if they're really going to take the, you know, open the hood and show you the deep tech stuff, that's a different question. But if they're just coming in to pitch you on the business. Um, it's very, very um, difficult, if, if even possible at all, to get someone to sign an NDA. People in other areas of the world, they get very protective. They want to keep their cards close to their chest be very protective. And so they don't want to share anything. So they'll say, no, I need an NDA. You say, well, then we can't talk because that's not the way we roll, right? So mm -hmm. I do think, you know, that's one cultural difference with just that particular region or example that I'm giving. Um, we are very um, confident people here. I always say I'm 100% of the time, I'm highly confident and about 10% of the time I'm right. So mm -hmm. that's kind of my style personally. I'm always going to go in very confident and hopefully once in a while I'll be correct. Um, but yeah, I do think you have to show confidence. You have to be, you know, humility is wonderful in certain circumstances, but if you're in front of an investor, they want to see confidence. They want to see that you, are con you have conviction, you have belief, you have confidence in what you're creating because you're asking them to give you money to, to further that opportunity. If you come in and go, well, you know, we kind of think it'll be an okay idea. What? Like, how's anyone going to have confidence that they should take a checkbook out and write you a check? So I think those cultural differences are highlighted. I think a lot of investors here, you know, we deal with so many foreign founders here, more than 50, I think the, the number is 52% of tech companies founded here were founded by non-US born um, founders. So it's extremely comfortable uh, in Silicon Valley for us to work with, you know, foreign founders. Um, in fact, uh, I think it's 36 or so percent of the greater Silicon Valley Bay Area is, is foreign born. So again, very, very comfortable environment for um, non-US uh, born uh, founders to come here. And I think a lot of people here understand that there are different cultural differences. But that said, I'm not saying anyone should try to be, you know, don't act American, mm -hmm. be who you are, be authentic. But I, I, I think demonstrating confidence and um, self-promotion is probably something that I think is not, you, you don't want to, you know, cut that one back. You don't want to pump the brakes on that one. You want to kind of go forward with great confidence and enthusiasm. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. Um, and honestly, I've always thought, you know, we, we need some Americans in New Zealand to just lift everyone's level off a, a little more, make us a little less humble. Um, <laughs> Get, get us achieving a little more. Um, a question here um, from Ralph. Um, as a Kiwi business expanding worldwide, would you say it's easier to enter the US market either with a local US office or with local US staff? Um, and what would be the best way to find staff in the US? Yeah, I see that question. Um, you know, it depends where you go in the US. What I mean by that is resources here in the San Francisco, you know, Silicon Valley area, very, very expensive. Not just the office space itself, depending on where you are, what city you open that office. If you open it in downtown San Francisco, it's going to be hugely expensive. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, use other states that have lower costs of, of uh, living, that might be an okay approach to set up an office. If you're able um, to, through the immigration side of things, if you're able to get your resources to the U.S. to staff the office. Um, certainly, you can work with people like Rebecca on the call here who can maybe help. But if you could do that and they have the intellectual you know, knowledge, the institutional knowledge of the company, um, that could be a great thing. But I would recommend not necessarily picking a highly expensive area to house yourself if you are on limited financial resources. Um, alternatively, um, you can leave a lot of resources in your home country, in this case, in, in uh, New Zealand. and open up maybe a business development slash sales type of uh, facing office and just have one or two people here doing that kind of work, but mm -hmm. leverage the lower cost of good, you know, uh, uh, expensive 
portion of staffing and keep them in your home country. So we see a lot of that where people will have salespeople and maybe one of the C-level executives, one of the co-founders, you know, are, are over here, but the rest of the resources are from the company are back home, wherever home would be here again in this example in New Zealand. So that's a common mm -hmm. approach that I would recommend. Yeah, hundred percent, and definitely, yeah, I noticed as well. Yeah, um, the, the level of salary um, in in San Francisco is, is so massive for a Kiwi company, and based on what you know, Kiwi companies usually raise over here, you you need to raise a whole lot more just to, you know just to get staff over over in San Francisco. So, um, I mean, we Absolutely. we did look at Austin um, as another really cool place that we know some Kiwi startups yep. about to head over to. Um, little less expensive. I mean, still relatively you know more expensive um, than New Zealand, um, but little bit, bit definitely more. less than san francisco and yeah. austin is a great city it's a great entrepreneurial city it's got a very good startup ecosystem there are several yeah. places around the u.s in general you mm -hmm. know silicon valley is still silicon valley yeah, exactly. you know it's like saying you know i want to i want to go you know say to see the sydney uh opera mm -hmm. house yeah. Well, you could say, but it's expensive in Sydney, so I'll just go to an opera house somewhere cheaper. It's like, well, it's not quite the same thing then, right? So Silicon Valley is still Silicon Valley, but Austin and plenty of other cities in the U.S. do have very good startup ecosystems. They are much smaller and, and underwhelming relative to Silicon Valley, but they're still very good for companies to set up a shop in on occasions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even just um, in the chat, Igor suggested renting a garage, but um, yeah, the garages are not not cheap either. <laughs> It'll still set you back a lot, you know, a lot more than your Nothing average. in the Bay Area is cheap, so. <laughs> yeah. um, a, a question from Igor, um, uh, what's better to use, um, either safe or conver convertible note for a pre-seed startup in, in San Francisco? Yeah, you know, that one is kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. I mean, you can kind of go either direction. I think in general, um, you know, safe notes were established quite a long time ago, about nine years back in 2013, Y Combinator kind of crafted the safe note. It was thought to be then rather entrepreneur friendly. And so it, at the expense of investors, right? So it removed investor protections and gave things more leniently to the entrepreneur. And so investors started to, you know, grumble a little bit. And then the year later in 2014, uh, 500 startups came out with the KISS note and it was uh, kind of uh, added back some of the investor protections. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if you think of it as kind of safe note, KISS note, and then convertible note. Convertible note is a debt instrument like the others. It's very familiar to investors. So we see a lot of convertible notes, um, but we also do see a lot of safe notes. So I think either one can work. It's a good conversation to have with your, your uh, kind of advisor on those areas when you're going uh, forward. There are certain things you should do with a safe note or a convertible note. Um, many of them will have something called a valuation cap. It's not actually the valuation of your business, but it's a commitment that the valuation that you, your money converts at will be this amount or lower. And they often offer a discount rate as well so that you even get a, a little more reward being an early investor. Some founders um, that I've worked with um, have done uncapped notes, which means they're not committing to the ceiling of the valuation. And that is challenging for a lot of investors. Certainly the investors uh, have varying risk tolerances and investment thresholds, but a lot of investors want to see kind of those elements. So a convertible note does have a valuation cap. It's, it's something I would recommend putting in there and it should be very meaningful. It shouldn't be just some high number that you think is, you know, good for you. It should be something that you imagine will be attractive to the investors and entice them to come aboard and support you. Mm, awesome. Um, another question related to um, um, investors. Um, would you say it's better for um, um, U.S. startups wanting to raise capital in the EU or China to rehome in those jurisdictions in order to make the investors more comfortable um, from over there? So U.S. startups that want to raise capital in the EU or China to rehome themselves to those jurisdictions. So I'm assuming, and Michael, if, if I'm getting it wrong, please correct me in the chat here, but I'm assuming you mean U.S. companies that want to provide solutions for the EU and or China market in your I think question. So. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're raising capital 
from those, it looks like they want to raise capital in those markets. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost the reverse of what I mentioned earlier, which is in the US, we would like to see foreign founders establish a, a presence and, and a foothold here in the US by creating a US entity, a US banking relationship. I believe the same would be in Europe. If you're really supporting Europe and you're seeking European investment, um, They'll probably not want to put money in your U.S. entity, although U.S. tends to be a little more comfortable for, for uh, non-U.S. investors. But I still believe if you were opening up markets in, say, Western Europe, for example, I would imagine Western European investors would have more comfort if your entity and your banking relationships were in the region. And so I would kind of say almost the same story, but reversed here in, in terms of either Europe or, or China or other markets in, in the Asian markets. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. I yes. hope that addresses the question. Yeah. And in, in, in order to do that, would you suggest just um, you're finding an advisor from each of those countries that you're looking to to sort of establish in? Yeah, we help a lot of foreign founders find American or U.S. advisors when they're trying to open up U.S. markets. And again, we try to get you know very very credible. I, I mentioned this hardware company that has the sanitizing um, hardware device. Um, one of the advisors, now they're not a foreign founder, by the way, but one of the advisors we brought onto their team was the former president of Dyson, a globally recognized um, innovator in hardware. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those pause moments, we hope that as investors look at their uh, presentation for consideration, they say, well, let's take a look at the team. Does this team have the ability to execute? You start looking at the operating people and you may not recognize any of them, but then when you look at the extended team, inclusive of the advisors, you say, well, hang on a second. The former president of Dyson is advising these, this team. There must be something good here. Why would this individual waste their time? And so that's the effect we try to do, whether you're a foreign founder trying to establish a US you know, market opportunity, try to get you those same caliber of advisors if we can. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's some great advice. Um, just a note for everyone watching, um, if you do have any questions, now is the time to chuck them in the Q&A um, or I'll also keep an eye on the chat box. So any, any, anything for Jeff, um, do chuck it in there. Um, a question here from Jim. Um, could you please give your views on compensating advisors in your experience, for example, via equity or other methods um, and how common or uncommon from your vantage point is this? Um, and yeah, he's just interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, it's a great question. It does come up rather frequently and we have our own um, kind of template, if you will, that we use as an advisor agreement, which includes the compensation. First and foremost, in seed or pre-seed um, stage companies where obviously cash is in short supply, uh, it's a very limited resource for that stage company, um, we would never suggest paying cash compensation to an advisor, never. Um, now, when it comes to the equity side, it typically will range between 0.15 to go maybe as high as 1.0%. And what you would typically see in an advisory agreement here is a two-year agreement. And they'll vest in whatever amount of equity is decided. There's, there's um, some tables that are included in the agreement we use that actually say, should it be 0 0.15 or 0 0.25 or 0 0.45 or all the way up to one? And it tells you what criteria. What you're really looking at is the level of performance that the advisor is providing to you, how much commitment they're making to you, and what stage of your business. The earlier the stage, the more risky and the more help you need. And so it varies. But again, it, the range is 0 0.15 to 1.0. So it, it, it's not, you know, don't throw the, a dart and hope you hit a number in between. We're just, there, there is a, a chart that shows you this. But the thing that's interesting to note is the, the common advisory agreements just say, whatever your equity is, it'll vest over two years. Now we've modified that in our approach because we've learned something over many years. I learned it long ago when I was an entrepreneur that advisors want, to vest as quickly as possible. And they also want to provide as much help as quickly as they can. They're not waiting until three weeks before their two-year anniversary to start helping you and then get their equity. So we actually have an acceleration plan for advisors that say you can vest over two years, or if you accomplish these six, seven, eight things that we agree you're going to do on behalf of the company, as soon as you complete them, you're vested. And sometimes you're going to get the best bang for your buck in general in the first six months. You know, they're not waiting again. They're just going to try and do everything they can as early as they can. They're very enthusiastic to join the advisory team and help you. And so 
um, we recommend you know, offering this kind of carrot incentive to advisors to do stuff. We always say what we don't need is an advisor for two years. What we do need is an advisor that does things that move the dial forward for our business. And we have very specific recommendations we use. Yeah, awesome. Um, and a question from Michael. Um, is that criteria chart available or is that is, is that part of um, Silicon Valley in your pocket or is that? Um, I will, at the end here, I'm going to put up a QR code and, and mm -hmm. a URL with a, a, we have a little discount offer for folks. And that QR code will take you to a place where you can register for tons of free resources. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, our advisor template is one of the free resources. So yes, uh, Michael, um, alternatively, you are welcome to email me and, uh, and you can get a copy of that. I'm happy to share it. Cool. Awesome. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A at the moment. So if anyone does have one, do chuck that in right now. Um, but what's next um, for you? Oh, wait, actually, wait, we just got one. Um, what do investors look for in an ed tech company? I mean, I guess that's probably, you know, similar to um, in general investing, but anything specific? Yeah. yeah. You know, I actually had an ed tech company in the 90s. So I'm a little familiar with the space. I've worked with several ed tech companies. You know, the one thing that I think investors get a little concerned and they want to kind of double click on, if you will, and dig a little deeper on is they want to know that if you're selling to, say, the education markets, that often has a very long sales cycle associated with it, particularly if it's a public school market. Um, or large public universities, like I, I'm a Berkeley alum, which is part of the U University of California system. Very, very, very large system. Also very um, challenging to do business with. Uh, and not, not because they want to be, they're just big. It's a cumbersome, big, you know, bureaucratic uh, kind of organization. And oftentimes as a public institution, they don't have resources that say a private educational system might have. Um, so I, I think you'd have to really demonstrate as an ed tech company that you have a clear path to market and a clear path to revenue generation. That might be a little bit higher hurdle for an ed tech company than it would be for other companies like a SaaS you know, software company doing something else, for example. So that would be my, uh, my best thoughts on specifically in the ed tech space. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, sure. Yeah, no. So yeah, what's, um, what does your next couple of months, couple of years look like? Are you still going to power through Silicon Valley in your pocket or are you working on anything else? Um, yeah, just curious what. what, what yeah, no, I mean, I, um, like I said, every day I'm working, you know, many hours because of the time zones that I work <laughs> across and I love what I do. I, I could not have more enthusiasm for working with creative and innovative founders who I'd say most of the time have ideas I could never have come up with. It just is a joy for me. So I love what I do. I will absolutely continue doing it. Um, our goal is to continue spreading it to other regions of the world that don't have, you know, the proximity to the resources that we have here in Silicon Valley. But our, our belief fundamentally is that Silicon Valley can actually be thought of more as a mindset than just a geography. You could be like a Silicon Valley like or like a Silicon Valley type company anywhere in the world, whether you're in New Zealand, in, in Asia, in Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, South Central America, it doesn't really matter. You can function and leverage the tools and techniques that we use. So my goal over the next you know, foreseeable future is to, is to do that, um, you know, spread the kind of Silicon Valley approaches to companies across the globe. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, 100% agree with that. It's more just, um, you know what you know, who you know, you don't physically have to be somewhere um, and I mean, the flight prices have just skyrocketed as well from New Zealand, unfortunately. Yep. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, Gasoline, I'm sure I'm probably. All the, all the and oil and gas prices driving that up. Gosh, yeah, crazy. Um, and yeah, so you do have a, yeah, a discount code. I know if you want to check that up um, now might be a Let good time. Let me do that. Um, for anyone watching, um, you can scan this uh, QR code that Jeff's just putting on his screen if you want to um, link through to the website where you can sign up for a 40% discount, which is super generous. We really appreciate that. Um, yeah, we, wa we want to spread it to as many people as we can. We try to price it very accessible uh, to global founders, not just to San, uh, you know, San Francisco or Silicon Valley based founders. So um, we have offerings that vary across uh, price ranges, depending on what each founder is looking for. But we're happy to offer you know, the discount to the, the listeners here today and others across Territory 3. Amazing. Um, so hopefully if you guys are 
scan that. Um, otherwise, I guess, you know, you can head to Silicon Valley in your pocket and this webinar has been recorded. Um, so we will be checking this up online um, within a couple of hours. Um, yeah, and there's a coupon code listed over on the right there. If you go to just, if you just go to Silicon Valley in your pocket, you just click on the accelerator and use territory three as a coupon code. That'll apply the 40% discount to whatever you sign on for. Ah, perfect, easy. Um, yeah, no, that's so, so great of you, um, Jeff, for offering that discount. We do really appreciate that for um, early stage startups who are looking to sort of, you know, enter that Silicon Valley um, mindset and, and connect with people and places over there. Um, so I know we've got just a couple of minutes now, so maybe we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. Um, sure. If people are keen to um, connect, what is the best way to do that with you? Yeah, I mean, people can absolutely email me at uh, jeff at S-V-I-Y-P, stands for Silicon Valley in your pocket. You can just email me at jeff at S-V-I-Y-P. Um, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. I saw Michael mention he'd hit me up on LinkedIn. That's great. I'm a LinkedIn guy, uh, very connected on LinkedIn and uh, always happy to, you know, to connect with others all, all across the globe and, and help out. So look forward mm -hmm. to connecting with you guys for sure. Oh, um, I've just had a quick request in the comments. Um, if you could bring the QR code up again for a second. Oh, sure. Sorry. Hang on. I have to switch the background because my fat oh. head gets in the way of it otherwise. <laughs> so give me just a moment. There we go. I hope that's up there now. Cool. Because I, I know I'm not sure if this if this view is like whoever's talking. So I'm just going to sit quiet for just just a couple of seconds. Sure. Okay, cool. Um, if, if, you know, you have missed the QR code, um, we will, yeah, have this up in a, in a recording as well, um, if, if you're keen to, um, to sign up and to check that out. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, thanks so much for everyone to tuning in. Um, just a, a quick shout out to our sponsors. I should have done this at the start. Um, NZ Trade and Enterprise, um, AWS, BNZ, Abandoned Management, Jasmine Holdings, and K1W1 for supporting Territory 3 Kiwi Landing Pad, helping um, uh, Kiwi startup community um, with, with going global and, and growing. Um, but a big thank you to Jeff for um, being our guest today. We've really appreciated all the insight. Um, even I'm, you know, I've been taking notes myself. Um, so I would, this is definitely um, a great, great webinar and I'll recommend this um, to all of our community um, to watch. And if you know anyone who, um, who has missed this webinar, do, do send it their way. Um, we will have the recording up in a couple of hours, but yeah, big thank you to Jeff and, and hopefully um, we'll see you in New Zealand soon. Absolutely plan on it. And uh, thank you so much, Lilia and Territory3. I, I so appreciate the chance to come and just share some of my experiences. I hope it's been uh, helpful and I hope it gives some, some insights to some folks who are listening in. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thanks so much, guys. We'll catch you on the next one. Take care. Bye.